Hey everyone, I'm author and astronomer John Reed. Now I've taught thousands of people how to use beginner telescopes for stargazing, but I can tell from the thousands of comments I get on this channel that a lot of people are still having trouble, even after we posted a video called How to Use Any Telescope. So this video is going to go straight to the point. We're going to break down the five things that you need to know to make the most out of your beginner telescope. And at the end of this video, I'll provide a list of the top targets for each season. Okay, the number one thing you need to do is know your gear and what it's capable of. You may not even have a telescope designed for looking at space at all. Before we get any farther, here are the four types of telescopes designed for beginners. Number one is the classic Dubsonian. Now these come in all sizes and at all budgets. Tabletop versions like this one used to be found for around $100 and they're great for kids, but can be hard to find these days. For most observers though, Dobsonians with apertures of 6 inches to 12 inches will give you the most outstanding views of deep sky objects from dark skies. I bought my first 6 inch Dobsonian used for $150 and my first 8 inch one used for $200. Next we have refractors. Now I happen to like short tube refractors on AZ mounts. Some people like the long tubes for clearer views of the planets and naturally high magnifications, but to each their own. The longer tube refractors also eliminate a lot of chromatic aberration, which are little halos around bright objects, but for me personally, that doesn't bother me that much, so the little shorter tube refractors are just fine. Now there are a lot of junk refractors on the market, which is why I recommend apertures of 100 millimeters or higher. While there are very nice telescopes with smaller apertures like the Skywatcher Evolux that I've reviewed on this channel, the 100mm rule of thumb simply eliminates a lot of the poorly designed telescopes on the market. If you're in the market for a refractor, look for one with 102 in the name. Now Costco tends to carry one of these, either the Nat Geo 102 or the Omni 102. I was able to pick each of these up for about $200. Then we have the SCT and Max style telescopes. Now these tend to be a bit more expensive but provide really sharp views and naturally high magnifications, which is great for the planets. A 5 inch SCT like this one now will run you around $600 in 2025. Smaller telescopes like the C90 can be found for much less. This telescope will fit in a backpack and I can take it on a hike up the hill, just collapsing the tripod and carrying this in my hand. And finally, we have Newtonians on AZ mounts, or sometimes you'll see them as tabletop Dubsonians. The small ones here, like this Explore Scientific Newtonian, are great for little kids, but under about 130 millimeters, for example the size of this scope, the telescopes tend to underperform optically. You also need to be on the lookout for the dreaded Bird-Jones telescopes. This is a nickname given to small Newtonians with high focal lengths, as in 900 millimeters or 1,000 millimeters. Bird-Jones Newtonians achieve these focal lengths by hiding a lens in the focuser. Most Newtonians with 114 or 127 in the name tend to have this issue. This little Explore Scientific is an exception. The most popular small Newtonian is the Skywatcher Heritage 130 and 150. These also come in a computerized version like this Virtuoso. The biggest advantage of these scopes is just how easy they are to use. Newtonians also require collimation. That means aligning the mirrors in the telescope so that light comes straight in from space and out the eyepiece. This is most easily done using a laser collimator which simply goes into the eyepiece hole. Then you have a little screen that tells you if your mirrors are aligned. Now this is a topic for another video, but that's basically the gist of it. There are two systems that are quite popular but are not designed for beginner stargazers. The first is this bird feeder telescope. These are spotting scopes, which are not designed for space at all. These scopes are fixed to camera tripods and have these little 45 degree diagonals. I've constantly asked myself why these are so popular, and on a recent live stream we figured it out. People are buying these to spy on their neighbors. The second type of telescope not designed for beginners are telescopes on these low quality equatorial mounts. In theory, these are designed so that you can track objects across the sky. The challenge is that these low quality mounts don't really function. The gears slip and they lose their alignment and they're just bad. Of course, in the comments you'll always find a few Mensa members talking about how they have these mounts and that they're quite easy to use. And maybe they're right 
But for me personally, I've been doing this full time for about a decade and I still find these EQ mounts, the beginner ones, a little bit too annoying to actually use for stargazing and I just don't think they're any fun. Now in terms of getting to know your gear, regardless of what type of telescope you have, it must have the following, a focuser, an eyepiece, and a finder. Note that the finder can be a finder scope or a unit power finder like a red dot finder or bullseye finder. Refractors also require a 90 degree diagonal and a mount that allows the telescope to point high in the sky. The mount may or may not have slow motion controls. All right, I know that was a lot of information about gear, but now you know. Moving on. Number two. Now that we know we've got the correct gear, we need to align the finder to the telescope. Now, as I said, finders come in various different types, but this concept can be used for all designs. Note that finder telescopes may rotate or mirror reverse the image. It's not broken, that's just how it's designed. That's one reason I prefer what's called unit power finders like Telrads, quick finders, and red dot finders. Those that don't magnify the sky at all. Now, aligning your finder is much easier to do during the day. If I'm in the city, I usually use a nearby chimney. But if I'm here at Stargaze Nova Scotia, I'll use that distant cell phone tower. So again, we're gonna use that cell phone tower. So what I'm gonna do is loosely get it in the finder. Then I'm gonna look in my eyepiece and I'll probably need to move the eyepiece around to center the target in the field of view. Okay, I've got it. So with the target centered in the eyepiece, I'm gonna move back to the finder, move it left and right and up and down until the object is centered in the finder as well. All right, now on to number three, choosing an eyepiece and focusing the telescope. Now I get questions on choosing an eyepiece more than probably any other question on this channel. At a very high level, most telescopes come with two eyepieces and sometimes a Barlow. The physically larger eyepiece, the one with the larger focal length, is meant for finding targets and for general observing. You'll use this one most of the time, and in many cases, this is the only eyepiece you'll use. The smaller eyepiece is for zooming into a target once you've found it. Speaking of zoom, you'll want to know how to calculate a telescope's magnification. You do this by dividing the telescope's focal length by the eyepiece focal length. For example, if the telescope's focal length is 1,000 millimeters and the eyepiece's focal length is 10 millimeters, then you'll have 100 times magnification, which is more than enough to see the rings of Saturn and many other targets. Now it's very important to note here that zooming in does nothing to increase the resolution, and in most cases does not even improve the view. The resolution of a telescope is determined solely by its aperture, which is fixed. However, a telescope's maximum magnification is generally too high for practical purposes. Now, as I mentioned, some telescopes come with a Barlow, Barlows are designed to be used occasionally and are intended to double or triple the magnification of the system. However, these should be used sparingly and in most cases, not at all. More often than not, these reduce the quality of the view and make the telescope more difficult to use. To use an eyepiece, simply insert the eyepiece into the focusing assembly if using a Newtonian or into the diagonal if using a refractor or SCT. Anytime you insert an eyepiece, you'll have to refocus the telescope on a distant object or a bright star. You may also need to focus the telescope between users as everyone's eyes are a little bit different. You'll know the telescope is in focus when the stars look like tiny pinpoints of light. If you have any trouble focusing your telescope, practice during the day. Now in terms of eyepiece upgrades, this is a very complicated topic and one that I've discussed in a separate video. But in summary, if you're thinking of upgrading the eyepiece, the simplest advice is to simply upgrade to a higher quality eyepiece of the same focal length as the eyepiece that came with the telescope. You typically don't get additional eyepieces to increase magnification. You upgrade your eyepieces to improve the quality of the view. Expect to pay between $100 and $200 for an intermediate quality eyepiece. One example of an intermediate eyepiece brand is Bader Hyperion, which makes eyepieces that look like this. Number four how to prepare for a night of observing. Here are a few things that you should do to prepare for a night of stargazing with your beginner telescope. The first thing you need to do is adapt your eyes to the dark. It takes about 15 minutes of not looking at lights or a phone screen to really see details in deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula. 
Note that this does not apply to planets or the moon, which can be seen from anywhere as long as there are no clouds. You also want to use a red flashlight to read your stargazing guidebook. Again, you don't want to be using a stargazing app on your phone as that will ruin your night vision. Stargazing guidebooks are definitely the way to go. It also really helps to find dark skies. By far the biggest factor in your ability to find deep sky objects like star clusters and nebula is the darkness of your skies. So if you're itching to see more cool stuff in space and you've exhausted your list of targets visible from the city, it's time to get out of town and find some dark skies. Be sure to do this when the moon is not in the sky in the evening. You can use a website like darkskymap.com to find the darkest skies nearest you. And a pro tip, stargaze from a chair. It is far easier to stargaze while sitting down. Lower the tripod legs until you can view the eyepiece comfortably from a seated position. Also, this is stargazing. Don't be tempted to try to take photos. Astrophotography and stargazing are very different hobbies. Stargazing should be easy and relaxing and require minimal technology. Astrophotography, while addictive, can be infuriating and really detracts from the stargazing experience. If you want to take pictures with a telescope, there are several other videos on this channel on how to do that. But that's not a topic for today's video. And number five, how to find targets in the night sky. Okay, so let's pretend it's nighttime and you've set up the telescope and it's in focus and everything is working as it should. You want to find cool things to see in the sky and you need to know where to start. If you're new to telescopes, well, it's best to start with the moon. The moon's phases change from night to night, so you'll never run out of cool things to see. That said, the first thing I typically do is observe the planets. The planets are found near the ecliptic. That's effectively the path the sun takes as it crosses the sky. With a beginner telescope, it's easier to find the naked eye planets, primarily Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. If you don't know where they are, the best option is to use an app like Stellarium, which will help you determine when the planet you want to observe will be in the sky. To observe a planet, first locate the planet without a telescope. Then get the telescope centered in the finder, and if your finder was aligned correctly, move over to the eyepiece, and the planet should be centered in the field of view. If not, you'll need to realign the finder. In a beginner telescope, Jupiter will look like this, a large ball with four bright points of light nearby, those are the Galilean moons. You should see two prominent cloud belts on Jupiter's surface. Saturn will look like this, and you should definitely see the rings as well as its largest moon, Titan. Venus will look like this. Notice how it almost looks like the moon. And since we can see Venus's nighttime side, it will also have a phase. Mars will look like this, generally like a bright red star. Deep sky objects require a different strategy since you generally can't see them with just your eyes, and stargazing apps tend to overstate what you'll realistically be able to see. In a given season, there are generally only a dozen or so great deep sky objects visible on a given evening with a beginner setup. That's why it's super helpful to have a stargazing guidebook that's organized by season to help you identify those objects that you'll realistically be able to observe. Examples of guidebooks include Turn Left at Orion, but also books like 110 Things to See with a Telescope if you're a little bit more experienced, or 50 Things to See with a Telescope for Kids. To find an object, open the book to the correct season and choose your object. Without your telescope, identify the constellation containing your target, and make sure it's overhead. Then using the book, align the telescope's finder precisely over the position of the deep sky object. Many stargazing guidebooks include Telrad rings, that help you match up the view through the finder to the view in the book. Again, if you position the telescope correctly and the finder was properly aligned, the object should be centered within the eyepiece's field of view. All right, as promised, here's some showstopper deep sky objects for each season. If it's summer, check out Globular Cluster M13, Double Star Albireo, and the Lagoon Nebula. If it's autumn, check out the Andromeda Galaxy and the Dragonfly Cluster. If it's winter, don't miss the Great Nebula in Orion, M42, and if it's springtime, check out open clusters like the Beehive and Globular Cluster M3. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on how to use a beginner telescope. Subscribe to Learn to Stargaze to take your stargazing to the next level. Check out our books on Amazon, specifically 110 Things to See with a Telescope and 50 Things to See with a Telescope for Kids. And remember, the future is looking up.